Um, I think what I do want to spend um, not skip over is making sure that this uh, setup makes a sense. That this is a rigid body with some distribution of mass and it tells you where the center of mass is. It's uh, uh, being made to rotate about this fixed point. So as we describe torque and other rotation, we are going to use this fixed point as our center of rotation. And we are given this uh, displacement L. We are given height of the most of the mass. And that um, I want you to have a mental image as we go over this uh, question so that um, so that it's not just the manipulation of formulas that what we are writing down relates to this uh, physical setup that you have a mental image of in your mind. So um, let me uh, skip to part B. Um, I, I, well, is it worth? I, I think it's worth it briefly going over, if only because it's a uh, um, well, it technically has some tangential, uh, pun intended, tangential connection to the connection to the static equilibrium. So when you are answering in part A, you are looking at, um, okay, at this position, there is no force acting on this thing other than gravitational acceleration. And um, how does that relate to angular acceleration of the thing? Now, um, now uh, in part B, what you have instead is, um, this is the setup of the question that uh, structure supposed to be strong enough to hold the pirate ship at the position of maximum height, uh, instead of letting it fall under gravity, and uh, hold the pirate ship at rest at the position of maximum height. So I hope uh, all this phrasing helps you connect you help you connect it to static equilibrium, that all this phrasing here is in roundabout say, it's saying that net force is zero at that position and net torque is zero at that position. So here you are kind of assuming that, um, that the force applied at the, that the force applied the support at this point, will be there will be enough net force there to make the net force equal to zero. And the question is only referring to the torque. So, um, so, so that's the situation that you want to analyze. So you start out with a free body diagram um, so that you know uh, what other force and torque due to forces acting on the pirate ship so that um, so that you can figure out how much torque you need to introduce, apply. So when you are holding, so this is kind of representation of pirate ship at the maximum angle. Uh, let me just give it a, a label theta max. I forget the numerical value. So, um, so the, um, there's really only two forces that are acting on this rigid body. There's the force due to gravity acting, modeled as acting at the center of mass. So here's a force of gravity, which should be equal to mg. And uh, there's no other force. The only other place there could be a force and the torque acting is here. And um, technically there will be two different uh, forces here. There will be uh, kind of a normal force acting here that uh, a counteracting force due to uh, gravity, and there will be a there would be a separate um, kind of a frictional force that's a tangent to the direction that this is sliding in, that would be applying uh, so a frictional force that's uh, applying a force, uh, which will lead to the torque. So um, the the Newton's second law equation for rotational motion that applies here would be net torque due to torque due to gravity plus the, the, the applied torque or what I'm labeling as torque of the maximum applied torque 
those added up should equal to zero. So here it's a really just a question of um, calculating what is the torque due to gravity and the maximum torque you have to apply should be just, uh, well, the, the magnitude is the same, it gets the opposite side. And the approach I would use here is uh, find the lever arm and calculate this gravitational torque as the gravitational force times the, well, times the lever arm. And the procedure for finding lever arm here, I think I described that in other videos. You take this uh, free body diagram, you find the line of action or the, the, the force vector extended into a whole line. Um, and you find the distance between your center of rotation and this line of action. So this distance is your lever arm. And once you draw this um, as a figure, then I hope from the geometry it makes sense uh, what that distance for lever arm is. You have this, uh, let's see, you have this right triangle here. So this angle here is same as theta max. And this hypotenuse here is L that was given before. So this lever arm should be L times sine of theta max. So once you have that, then um, you have everything to plug in and find the uh, maximum torque that you need to be able to apply. So good, yeah, you might see something like this on your um, on your exam in the context of uh, static equilibrium, where you are, what you are trying to do is apply the equilibrium condition. So, um, so I, I guess uh, maybe for your exam three, this is a little bit too simple. So maybe I won't be giving you anything like this. Part C is what was uh, uh, too much to test on your exam two because of how much topic your exam two was already covering. So. Um, so you are, uh, although probably not as complicated as this exact setup, but um, you will still be asked to calculate some rotational inertia over a thing that has non-uniform density. And that's a key thing. If it's a, a body with a uniform density, then you have a table of rotational inertia, you might even be able to use parallel axis theorem to uh, calculate the new rotation inertia about a new axis so without using any integrals. But um, it, to uh, prevent you from doing that, I'll be giving you a question that explicitly has a body that has a non-uniform density. And it's gonna be a one-dimensional problem, so you won't have to do any integral more complicated than what you will see here, um, but um, but so that's the whole setup that you will need to be able to, you um, you'll have to you'll have to set up the um, you will have be, to be able to set up the the integrand for the thing you'll be integrating and you'll have to be able to do the integral. So. Um, so yeah, read the question. And so this is what the setup looks like. Um, let's see, um, do I want to, I'm trying to decide if I want to draw this horizontally or vertically. In your, in the post uh, to the solution, I have it drawn vertically. So let me just draw it horizontally. I mean, I mean, it doesn't really matter, um, but um, horizontal, it's uh, a little bit easier to draw a few features. So let me draw this horizontally. So that's the center of rotation. Um, I guess uh, let me start out with the center of mass of the pirate ship. And this is the kind of representation of the, the kind of physical extent of the pirate ship. And, um, and in the problem statement in the previous page, this was given as L. And this is where you have to read the problem very carefully because the problem statement defines all these symbols, um, well, in particular X. It does de define H, but you know, H is not defined any differently from how we are using it from um, initial problem statement. So we can just leave that alone. 
it's the X uh, where you want to be careful in how you treat it. It, gives, it tells you how it's treating X. X represents the position on the rod from the bottom of the rod. Um, so the rod distance is that X equal to zero. Um, so from the bottom of the rod, so it's this position here that represents X equals zero. And I guess the way I have this drawn, X is getting positive uh, going to the left. So um, at this position where X is equal to H is where um, the density of the thing is gonna be zero, yeah, I guess. So, so that's the setup. Um, uh, make sure you spend enough time to have an intuitive understanding of this geometric setup. Then these are the steps that you go through in order to do the uh, direct calculation or, or sorry, calculation of rotation. Let me write this down. Uh, calculation of rotational inertia. Yeah, rotational inertia by direct integration. And I don't think I've ever given these as a number the steps. And um, I hope it, some of this you can, you kind of think through it and figure it, figure it out on your own. And the steps you figured out kind of match to the steps I'm giving you here. But this is one version of the steps that I would give. Sorry, I need to reset something. Okay, so step number one is you draw the picture and you make sure that you understand the setup of your geometric object. So let me just call that understand setup. And that's what I just, what I have done. And you need to do that so that you can do the second step is you draw a representative, um, representative mass element. Uh, draw a representative mass element. Because what I'm going to need to be able to do is I'm going to need to be able to break this up into small pieces, pieces that are small enough that each one of these pieces I can treat that as a point mass. So this is a representative element that has some um, infinitesimal size. Uh, let me erase this other marking here, which has this infinitesimal size dx. And I'm going to treat this element to ha as having infinitesimal mass dm. And this dm is gonna, I'm gonna have to be able to represent it, represent this in terms of the density of the thing and the, the coordinate variable so that it's something that I can integrate over later. So I have this representative mass element. Um, okay, so I have that um, element that I can visualize, imagine uh, for the third step. Um, third step is write an expression for for the um, um, for the infinitesimal contribution to rotation inertia, or what I'm going to label as di. So this is the so that's the infinitesimal contribution to the rotation inertia to the whole thing, or rotation, the whole rotation inertia of the whole thing from this small element dm. So it's going to, so remember the rotational inertia of a point mass is mass of the thing times the distance uh, squared, distance from the rotational axis squared. So I'm going to have to write something similar here. I'm going to have to write the mass of this element, that's my dm, which I'm going to expand out a little bit later. And I need to write down an expression for distance here. And in some setups, you can use the single variable, 
to do pull double duty to serve as the coordinate variable and distance. Here I can't really do that because the problem already gave a meaning for x and this x does not stand for distance from the uh, where it's being rotated from. So um, I need to um, write a new expression um, that's going to represent d distance as a function of x, the coordinate variable. So that um, so that I can e eventually uh, write out everything on the right hand side in terms of x. So let me just write down this symbolic representation for now. Distance uh, from the rotational axis squared. Um, so that's my um, that's my infinitesimal contribution. Then um, then I have to rewrite. Uh, rewrite everything in terms of coordinate variable, technically coordinate variables, but um, I'll only give you one dimensional problem, so there'll be only one variable for you to worry about, worry about and constant. This is preparation for the final step, which is uh, do the integral. integral um, over the whole reached body. So I haven't given you this um, specific set of steps because you know at some point the problem solving it's not following you know, following a rigid set of steps. Um, we did that with a standard strategy as a kind of model of uh, coming up with a problem solving strategy but as you continue your study of physics and engineering you should develop um, ability for yourself to come up with these uh, these strategies on your own without someone giving this to you, well, without someone spoon feeding this to you. So here I have two expressions that need to be expressed in terms of a coordinate variable, dm and the distance d. The dm is the easier one that uh, you kind of get it from the, the definition of density. So um, density is the, that's the length per, Sorry, uh, that's the mass per length. So really uh, what uh, the density in a kind of rough schematic uh, symbolic term, it's the well amount of mass per length. So you can uh, rewrite this, uh, sorry, there's a bit of an abuse of notation going on, but ignoring that, you can rewrite this to get an expression for dm. Uh, that's the density times dx. So um, I'm going to be writing this uh, with the density as a function of x. It's already given to me as a function of x uh, times dx, and that'll give me the, the mass element in terms of the coordinate variables that I'm looking for. The part where you need to spend a little bit of time um, thinking through is the distance from the axis of rotation. Um, so, because you need to kind of uh, think through this uh, geometry here. So, um, it would have been easier if uh, somehow the L that we were given wasn't overlapping with the H at all, but unfortunately they overlap. So, um, um, so I think I need to start up uh, by figuring out how much this overlapping um, portion is. And I have a feeling, ah, here it is. Hint, to the center of the mass of the rod is at h over four above the bottom of the rod. Okay, so I guess what I'm given actually is the portion that is not overlapping. So instead of the portion that's overlapping, I'm told the portion, um, so if this is uh, where L ends, uh, L is to the center of mass, that's uh, how it was described in the previous page. Then this distance here, I'm told in the hint, is H over four. So um, these are some 
um, a few points where you can check your uh, check the expression that I'm going to be writing down that d at x equals zero that has to be the entire distance l plus this portion that's not overlapping. So that should be l plus h over four. That's at um, d of uh, x equal to zero. And um, just to have uh, more confidence with the expression that I'll eventually write down, I can write down um, a fixed expression for d where x is equal to h. That's at the other end of the pirate ship. And um, that should be L minus this overlapping portion, which will be um, the H minus H over four. four uh, so it should be L minus three quarters of H. So uh, this is why I take pains to draw this figure, look at this figure, make sure that the expressions that I have here uh, fits in with the geometry that's represented in the figure there. Um, take a minute or so verifying that. Once you are sure that um, these expressions, these expressions as a, something that represents the value of the, at this fixed point, then now your job is to try to come up with an expression for D. Um, and after some trial and error, this is what you should come up with d of x is equal to this maximum value, l plus h over 4 minus x. And you can double check that um, um, by plugging in, I guess, x equals h and uh, looking at how the d varies as x varies. And uh, so once you are confident with that, then now you're ready to write down an expression that you can integrate the infinitesimal contribution to the rotation inertia from this tiny section of the pirate ship is, let me, um, it's gonna um, in, be integrated with respect to variable x times, let me write down L of x, that's uh, 3m over h cubed times h minus x squared, that's the density times uh, this expression here, d of x, um, l plus h over four minus x squared. So you have to integrate this over the entire rod to get the rotational, entire rod, entire pirate ship. So entire ship to get the rotational inertia of the ship. Um, then, um, what the rep question? Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question is like, how did you get the x uh, when you solve for the d all x as a function of x, l plus x by four minus x? Yeah, that's what the confusion. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, trial and error. <laughs> uh, let me, let me just uh, um. So I, I say trial and error um, because there is no one single fixed set of steps I can give you that will work all the time. This is uh, really the intuitive portion of um, this problem solving. I, I think uh, what I can guide everyone to is writing down this expression that at x equals zero, that this is the correct distance. Yes. I'm going to assume yes. Yeah. <laughs> and okay. that this is the correct expression for the other end of the pirate ship. That at this end, that this gives the correct distance. Right. Um, those fixed points, they are easier. Those are the ones you can come up with um, relatively easily. You just draw the picture. And writing down this uh, d of x as a function of x, that is the hard part. So um, what you do have to guide you is that the, from the problem statement, x was defined to be zero here. And that x increases going to the left, increasing up to h here. 
So at this point, really, um, what I would say is trial and error. So you know that whatever you come up with here, it's not going to go like x squared, and it's not going to go as 1 over x. Mm -hmm. It's going to be something that's a, a linear function of x. It, right? It, there's no other choice that would uh, make reasonable sense. Then you might try something that looks like d of x is some constant plus x. Then as you try that, you should figure out fairly soon that, oh, that makes no sense. It, it's not going to fit with these two facts that we are trying to fit this to. So once you um, make uh, fail at that plus sign making it that work, then you try to fit uh, d of x is some constant minus x. And hopefully there's enough intuition that you realize that there's no coefficient in front of it. Like it's not going to be minus uh, 2x or minus 3x. It's uh, how the distance changes. It's going to be just, uh, you know, it's going to be the same scale as how x changes. And so, so at this point, so once you figure out this much, that the portion that depends on the variable x is minus x then the rest is really figuring out this portion by trial and then error. You want this to be correct so that when x is equal to zero, that you get this value. Then, you know, that makes actually L plus H over four a fairly pretty good guess to try here. L plus H over four. Now, uh, if that's all you did, then, then, um, you have no confidence whether this is correct or not. You're just guessing. When you are doing things by trial and error, you need some way to check your guess. That's why I have this second expression here so that I can plug in, um, so that I can plug in a value of x equal to h and see if I get a value that I thought I should get when x is equal to h. Again. When you plug it in, you get it. Okay. So I, I understand. Yeah. yeah, I think I understand. Yeah. So, so this is really why um, um, there's no substitute to practicing physics problems because some of the solution steps, there's no in specific instruction I can give you. The only instruction I can give you is trial and error. <laughs> and, um, the best bet for you to, for this trial and error process to take place is really in the comfort of your own home with a practically unlimited amount of time, not in the context of an exam setting where you only have two hours and if the first two or three things you tried to didn't work, then you are practically well, you, you, you're done for the exam. Um, so this is why we, uh, this is why practice matters <laughs> because um, some of the problem solving, it really only comes through by trial and then error. And you need plenty of time to try that trial and then error. So, so for the rest of this problem, I'm going to take this as given that you came up with this through trial and then error on your own time somehow, and that you double checked it with the expression with the constant checkpoints that you thought should work. So, um, uh, I, I, sorry, no more on those available. Um, so, so we were at uh, trying to do the integral for the ship. And I start out with this uh, kind of schematic uh, description of integral over the shape. And the task for you is then to figure out what are the limits of actual integration that corresponds to this uh, schematic or kind of descriptive uh, representation of the, the object that you're integrating over. So when you're integrating over the shape, you're starting from here, x equal to zero and you are ending at this point at x equals h. So you integrate from x equals zero to h and that should work. And um, I guess uh, I won't actually do the actual integral other than to, I can show that it's doable. Uh, so let me do that with all from alpha. This was one of the um, kind of thing I regretted uh, writing out the exam solution two years ago that this was too long. 
um, that all these polynomial expressions, you know, it's doable, it's polynomial, it's doable, everyone can do it. But um, it takes quite a bit of work to work it out. So um, if I were to, so I've, I know that now, so I'll be uh, mindful of how uh, long that particular complex of a polynomial integration takes. But let me just uh, um, do this all, all from alpha, just to show that it's doable integrate, uh, so three times M divided by H cubed times H minus X squared times L plus H over four minus X squared. I'll probably get rid of at least one of those squares if I were to give a similar problem. From X equal to zero to H. And all from alpha is usually good about um, interpreting how, what I mean. Uh, so it did uh, interpret correctly. I mean to integrate with respect to X and verify all the rest of the mathematical expressions are fine. Then after you're done with this complicated integral, indefinite integral, you end up with this um, definite integral, which hopefully matches the, the solution that I posted. Um, so really, and this is the thing that I'll be trying to test it for. Uh, given a new situation that involves a uh, variable density so that I know you have no other way to solve it other than to uh, set up the direct integration and actually do the integration. Um, are you able to, um, <laughs> are you able to understand? So wait, let me get my, highlight pen. Uh, so what I will be testing for and looking for is, are you able to understand the setup that's described in English words mostly? And are you able to I isolate a kind of a representative mass element, which you can use to write out this infinitesimal rotational inertia? And can you uh, go to the step of rewriting this portion here in terms of the coordinate variable in preparation for doing the integral. So, so that's what I'll be looking for. And there's a kind of a simpler example that I can do later on in the exam review session um, so that um, the problem with this question was it was way too complicated. I was trying to test it for too many things all at once. Uh, I do have a simpler question that I used in past semesters um, that, which is actually, I think a version of the lecture, um, things I've done in the lecture. So, so this is the um, kind of re-presentation of um, direct calcul or calculation of rotation inertia by direct integration. And um, um, I, I, yeah, so, um, and I, I think it, it is important for you to develop the skill to, uh, for coming up with the expression like this. Frankly, a lot of the things you might do for a physics exam, um, it, it's a step that can be automated. You, you saw me do the integral on all from alpha in one second. It's like, so your skill in evaluating this integral by hand, it's not a valuable skill. You can, computer algebra system can do that a lot better and quicker than you can. But the skill that is valuable in an engineer or a scientist is the skill to come up with this expression. That's the one step that can't be automated, that requires a human being with an intuitive problem solving to write down. So, so um, I'll try to test it for that somewhere in your exam. Um, 